This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on insurance. Today I'd like to talk about some defenses available to parties who are sued claiming damages due to mold infestation. One important defense is the economic loss doctrine. The economic loss doctrine is a judicially created doctrine providing that a commercial purchaser of a product cannot recover from a manufacturer under the tort theories of negligence or strict product liability damages that are solely economic in nature. It is a defense to tort claims that arise in construction matters and in all claims related to property damage due to mold. Under the economic loss doctrine, a plaintiff who suffers only financial injury, as opposed to personal injury or emotional distress or damage to real or personal property, as a result of another's actions, cannot seek recovery in tort. Instead, the plaintiff is limited only to recovery under a breach of contract theory. The Pennsylvania Superior Court decision in David Flume Paving v. Foundation Services in 2002 confirmed the ongoing validity of the economic loss doctrine in certain lawsuits arising out of construction projects. The California Supreme Court defines the economic loss doctrine as follows, quote, Whatever the product, Strict liability affords a remedy only when the defective product causes property damage or personal injury. The economic loss doctrine is a judicially created doctrine under which a purchaser of a product cannot recover from a manufacturer on a tort theory for damages that are solely economic. It is based on an understanding that contract law, and particularly the law of warranty, is better suited than tort law for dealing with purely economic loss in the commercial arena. Therefore, when contractual expectations are frustrated because of a defect in the subject matter of the contract, and the only damages are economic losses, the exclusive remedy lies in the contract. Close quote. Courts across the United States identify the following reasons for the creation of the economic loss doctrine. One, to protect the party's freedom to allocate economic risk by contract. Two, to encourage the party best suited to assess the risk of economic loss such as the purchaser, to assume, allocate, or insure against that risk, and three, to maintain the fundamental distinction between tort law and contract law. In contract law, the duty of one party to the other arises from the terms of the particular contract. The goal of a contract is to hold parties to the terms of the agreement, so that each receives the benefit of his or her bargain. The aim of tort law is to protect people from unexpected and overwhelming misfortunes. The law imposes tort duties on manufacturers to protect people from the physical harm or personal injury that may result from defective products. Therefore, When a product fails in its intended use and injures only itself, causing only economic damages to the purchaser, the reasons for imposing a tort duty are weak, and those for leaving the party to its contractual remedies are strong. In Gunkel v. Renovations, Inc., an Indiana Supreme Court decision from 2005, mentioned in its decision, the context of strict product liability is germane. The Indiana Supreme Court reversed the trial court 
which had found that an entire house was the defective product and applied the economic loss rule to prevent the plaintiff's recovery of damages. The Supreme Court reasoned, quote, The Court of Appeals held that here the product is the entire house on which the stone facade was installed. Under this view, the damage caused to other parts of the house by the alleged defect of the facade is damage to the product itself and is barred by the economic loss rule. As will be seen from the foregoing, we disagree. The economic loss rule does not bar recovery in tort for damage that a separately acquired defective product or service causes to other portions of a larger product into which the former has been incorporated. The product or service purchased from J&N was the facade added to the exterior of the Kunkel's home by J&N. J&N installed the facade under an arrangement with the Gunkels that was independent of the contract with renovations to build the home. Therefore, the economic loss rule precludes tort recovery for damage to the facade itself. But tort recovery for damages to the home and its parts caused by the allegedly negligent installation of the facade is not limited by the economic loss rule. Close quote. In Arizona, the economic loss doctrine bars plaintiffs in certain circumstances from recovering economic damages in tort. An Arizona court said, quote, This court has previously applied the doctrine only to products liability claims. Today, we apply the doctrine in a construction defect case and hold that a property owner is limited to its contractual remedies when an architect's negligent design causes economic loss but no physical injury to persons or other property. The economic loss doctrine appropriately applies in this context because construction contracts typically are negotiated on a project-specific basis and the parties should be encouraged to prospectively allocate risk and identify remedies within their agreements. These goals would be undermined by an approach that allowed extra-contractual recovery for economic loss based not on the agreement itself, but instead on the court's post hoc determination that a construction defect posed risks of other loss or was somehow accidental in nature, close quote. This is Flagstaff Affordable Housing versus Design Alliance, a 2010 decision of the Arizona Supreme Court. Then in Kriegler versus Eichler, Eichler Holmes, a 1969 decision of the California Court of Appeal, the court fully examined the economic loss rule and drew the line of demarcation between an economic loss and physical injury to the property, including to the defective product itself. They allowed recovery of strict liability damages in the latter instance. California's cornerstone strict liability construction case permitted recovery of strict liability damages where defectively fabricated radiant heat tubes installed in the substandard concrete slab of the plaintiff's residence caused failure of the heating system and entailed emergency permanent repairs, removal and storage of furniture, and the need for the plaintiff and his family to find temporary replacement shelter. In order for the product to be found defective, the plaintiff must demonstrate that the product failed to perform as safely as an ordinary consumer would expect when it was used in an intended or reasonably foreseeable manner. 
Evidence to establish the defect can be as simple as the testimony of the person who used the product, or as complex as calling experts like the designer and the people who assembled the device on the production line as witnesses. In a tort action, the burden of proof is always imposed on the plaintiff. He or she must prove by a preponderance of the evidence all the elements of the tort. Once the plaintiff makes a prima facie case showing that the injury was proximately caused by the product's design, the burden should appropriately shift to the defendant to prove, in light of the relevant factors, that the product is not defective. If the manufacturer shows that it took reasonable precautions to design a safe product, or otherwise acted as a reasonably prudent manufacturer would, the judge or jury may conclude it was not negligence. However, strict liability would be found if the product was defective. The peculiar risk doctrine can also be used as a defense to mold claims. Under that doctrine, an innocent third party injured by an independent contractor's negligence could sue the contractor's hirer, the developer or general contractor, so that the injured party did not have to rely on the solvency of the contractor to be compensated for injuries. In California, workers' compensation laws create an exclusive remedy. In Prevet v. Superior Court, the California Supreme Court opined that the availability of workers' compensation insurance barred an employee's recovery from the developer or general contractor of the independent contractor for which he worked, absence of showing of affirmative contra contribution by the hirer to his injury. In every suit, whether mold-related or not, but every suit relating to mold, the statutes of limitations or the statutes of repose are a key issue to be resolved at or before trial. If it can be shown that a statute of limitations or a statute of repose applies, the case will end and the plaintiff will recover nothing. If established by a motion for summary judgment or other pretrial proceeding, the case will never go to trial. As the Iowa Supreme Court stated, if the period of limitations is the outer time limit for making the investigation and bringing the action, the period begins at the time the person is on inquiry notice. That is when they see the mold growing on their walls. It should also be pointed out that Iowa courts have been reluctant to adopt a broad application of the discovery rule for fear that creating a rolling statute of limitations would effectively obliterate the intended protection of legislatively established time limits. Some courts toll the statute of limitations, finding it does not start to run until the damage-causing event is discovered by the claimant. The discovery rule is a judicially created exception designed to ameliorate the harsh and sometimes unjust results stemming from a strict application of a statute of limitations. Before 1973, most states enforced the doctrine of contributory negligence, which barred all recovery when the plaintiff's negligent conduct contributed as a legal cause in any degree to the harm suffered by the plaintiff. The defense was based on the ancient maxim of the law that no one may take advantage of his own wrong. However, in modern practice, applying the defense of contributory negligence strictly is found to be unfair because under it a plaintiff only 1% responsible for his or her injury would recover nothing and the person 99% responsible would avoid having to provide compensation for the injury. Contributory negligence was defined before 1975 as, quote, conduct on the part of the plaintiff which falls below the standard to which he should conform for his own protection and which is legally contributing cause cooperating 
with the negligence of the defendant in bringing about the plaintiff's harm. While the courts struggle with the basic unfairness of contributory negligence defense, and as time passed, they adopted the comparative negligence standard, which allows the recovery of the plaintiff to be reduced by his percentage of fault. Another defense is assumption of the risk, which is something that would apply regularly in mold claims, where a voluntary participant suffers an injury that is a foreseeable risk of participation. Any factual dispute as to the negligence of the person from whom damages are sought, failing to prevent injury to the person seeking damages, is irrelevant with respect to the issue of assumption of the risk. The defense would apply to a person who buys a property obviously infested with mold or fungi. A defendant asserting assumption of the risk must establish three elements. One, that the plaintiff had actual or constructive knowledge of the risk. Two, that the plaintiff appreciated the character of the risk. And three, that the plaintiff voluntarily accepted the risk, giving the time, knowledge, and experience to make an intelligent choice. Assumption of the risk of injury is a defense alleged in every construction defect suit and in every mold infestation type plaintiff suit. It seems especially important when mold is involved and the plaintiff continues to expose him or herself to mold after it is discovered. This video was adapted from my book, Mold Claims, Volume 4 which is available as a Kindle book or a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be interesting or useful to you or your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and click on the Like button or the Rumble buttons as you do. And also subscribe to my blog, my Substack publications, my Locals community, so that you can learn of future videos and future blog postings. Thank you for your attention.